there we go. So, um, welcome to Classics Academy. This is very exciting today to have a former Runshaw classicist back, Harvey Vivian. I don't know how many years it was ago now that you've left. It must be, what, this is five years? We're into the fifth year now, I think, yeah. Something like that, isn't it? Because you're now starting a PhD at the University of Cambridge. And this is really exciting that today we are taking something that we are familiar with from classics uh, syllabus, which is classical art, but taking it into a new area, which is reception and how it's influenced uh, Japanese uh, woodblock prints, which is brand new to me. So a massive thank you for from us, Harvey, to come along and talk to us. And I'll hand over to you now. No, I mean, thank you very much for having me. Thank you, everyone, for, for, for coming and listening. Um, so, yeah, I mean, um, I don't know if anyone is particularly familiar with um, the context of the Edo period in Japan or the, or the late Tokugawa shogunate, but I'll be introducing all of that. First, I want to say a little bit about classical reception. Classical reception studies is when we talk about um, anything from the classical world, from the ancient, ancient world that has influenced um, things in, um, in the world since anything after the ancient world that can you can have medieval renaissance classical receptions all the way up to today um, in popular culture like music video games film um, and what i'm going to be talking about is art is, is print culture so um, on your handout i've given you uh, a, a map of japan um, uh, in the in the late edo period um, and i'll be mentioning a few places but i'll refer you back to where they are on the map that's just for ease so that you're not not confused. I've also given you some defined terms. Um, Edo, when I say Edo, that is modern day Tokyo. That's what the, the city of Tokyo used to be called um, in the, uh, well, from the 17th century um, through to the 19th century. Um, but what we've got in front of us here is a, a Japanese woodblock print by a artist called Utagawa Toyoharu. Now this is very interesting because this is, it's called, if you can see on the, on the PowerPoint, a perspective picture of a kabuki theater. Kabuki, one of the traditional Japanese forms of theater. Um, but um, what's interesting about it is it's a perspective picture. Previous to this, many Japanese art forms, one which we'll see in a second, were very two dimensional. Um, they didn't give the impression of depth very much. Now it's not a necessarily classical um, takeaway, but when Dutch traders had been trading for over 100 years by the 1770s uh, with the Tokugawa shogunate, they brought Western paintings. And uh, that included, obviously, perspective paintings. And Japanese artists had not been working off the basis of using uh, one point perspective or multiple point perspective that Western art often uses. And so this was a big um, kind of intellectual and artistic revolution in the material culture of Japan. Um, and this is an early example from the, the 1770s of um, seeing this perspective in play. We see as the boardwalk of the theatre towards the main stage extends, uh, things get smaller, they get further away. We're used to that, but at the time um, in Japan, this was quite a new phenomenon. Now, Utagawa Toyoharu is the founder of an artistic lineage, the Utagawa School, um, in Japanese names. Um, Utagawa is the last name that goes first in the, in, in the pronunciation of the names. Um, so Toyoharu um, starts the Utagawa lineage, and he also starts this very interesting play with classical imported imagery. Um, before that, I'll give you a little bit of context, um, because I imagine not many people are familiar with the history of Japan in this period. Um, Japan had just come out of what is called the Warring States period from around the uh, 15th century, um, Japan had been um, up basically internally divided and uh, between several, so, uh, several estates and lords called daimyo. And then in the um, late 17th century, oh, sorry, the early 17th century, late 16th century, um, the uh, shogunate, the shogunate system was was kind of revised to give power to one family, the Tokugawa family, the Tokugawa uh, line of shoguns. Before then, uh, there were two warlords, Oda Nobunaga um, and Toyotomi Hideyoshi. 
Um, but but the, the Tokugawa established in the 1600s what's called the long peace. From around 1615 to 1868, there is no uh, war inside Japan, nor is there war with anyone outside of Japan. This is often seen as a closed, uh, a closed country. Um, it used to be said by scholars that Japan didn't trade with many uh, nations, didn't really have a, have a view on the outside world. But that view has recently been challenged. And in fact, during this long peace, Portuguese missionaries, and then once they were expelled in 1639, Dutch traders from the Dutch uh, East India Company came and imported many, many things. Now, both the Portuguese and the Dutch were known as Nanbanjin, um, which means um, it, it can mean southern barbarians, southern outlanders, basically, you know, a, a, a way of delineating other people from out there rather than um, Japanese people. Now, these fold, this folding screen um, from Kobe is an incredible example of the art that gets produced from the initial contact. Right, this is in the 1570s, where the, most of my talk is going to take place in the 1770s onwards to around the 1830s. But this is right at the start of this um, interaction with foreign peoples. And um, these beautiful folding screens uh, would be put up, but they're painted in these, these gorgeous colours to show what foreigners looked like, what it was like when they came to shore. And, and you can see what I mean when I talk about the more 2D feel of this art, right, as a more traditional form of art. There isn't much going on in terms of perspective. The people are kind of the same size, no matter where they are on the, uh, on the screen apart from the people in supposed to be far away buildings um, in the right hand corner. Um, but this is the beginning of a kind of Japanese consciousness of what um, European barbarians, although European isn't a name that will be used um, to denote otherness or foreigners for a while, but what, what Southern barbarians, what Nanbanjin are, are actually like um, and what it means to, to interact with them. We see all kinds of animals, the kind of uh, dogs, the horses that the Portuguese bring, um, and the traders uh, that come with them to sell imported things, and also fundamentally to buy things from Japan. Harvey, I'm really, really yeah. sorry, to, sorry to interrupt you, just um, the slides aren't changing on our side. Oh, that's... So I presume you're talking about the second slide. It tell, yeah, it tells me that it's the, that it is still showing it out which, wide. Which is a shame. Um, I don't know if I can, can I can move it. Is that you? Oh, you've moved it there, or is that me? That's you. That's me. Can you see that now? We can see that now. Yes, fabulous. Okay. So that's the one you were talking about with the, the different perspective, wasn't it? And, and the barbarians. So can you see? Okay, I might have to keep it in. Hang on. Sorry about that. No, I will... Don't worry. I just thought because you're describing the art and I, I think I was like, yeah. I don't think it's the one that's on the screen. No, absolutely. I will. Um, I might have to keep it like this then. If, if I, can you see it in full screen now? The um, first one. Well, it's it's kind of showing us your your PowerPoint with the slides running down the left. Ah, uh, right. Okay, that's the thing. So I've entered into full screen. That I may just have to keep it like this. Um, okay. Unfortunately. Um, yes, that's changing. Fabulous. Well, okay. I'll minimise this. So there we go. That should. That's perfect. Thank right. you. I'll yeah. just turn it off. Cheers. No worries. Okay, so now you can see uh, the Namban folding screen. Um, and so, so as I was saying, yeah, there's the, the, the only real sense of perspective we get is the different size of the people in the right hand side who are in buildings that are supposed to be slightly further away, slightly more removed, or the people on the boat. Um, and the rest of this is all about, I mean, there is a direct contrast you can see between, um, can you see my cursor? So you can see a direct contrast between what the Japanese people were wearing, a lot of kimonos, robes and cloaks, and the um, strange to a Japanese viewer style of clothing of the Europeans. Um, and that is what is kind of important with, um, with these first contacts, is that the Japanese are discovering both themselves and other people through this art. But um, it's not Namban art that, that we're interested in. We're interested in, in, in classical, um, classical takeaways from, from art that was, that was brought in. Um, so I will just change. Um, so as I said, the, the Dutch um, had replaced the Portuguese 
from the mid 17th century um, as the main trading partners with Japan. The Tokugawa shogun himself gave the permissions to the Dutch East India Company to, um, to visit um, and to trade certain things, specific things. They did bring books, but we have very little um, evidence to say that anyone widely read any classical literature. The Dutch did bring Suetonius, copies of Suetonius's biographies of 12 Caesars, um, and did bring other things, but these were often purchased by very interested um, uh, samurai in this, in this period, samurai are not warriors anymore because there's no one to fight, they're intellectuals, they become uh, the main people who are interested in what the Dutch are bringing and they would buy up these books and they wouldn't have a widespread circulation. Um, it, Edo Japan is a highly literate culture, um, but also not one in which uh, books in the same way are um, as they are in as they were in Europe at the time were reprinted and, and bought um, are consumed. But this here, what you're looking at here, is the island of Dejima or Deshima. Um, this is a man-made island off Nagasaki. Now um, you may have heard of Nagasaki. You might, you might not know where it is. It's in Kyushu, and I think Kyushu is marked out on your map. It's the southernmost island of Japan. Nagasaki is a major city even today uh, in Kyushu. And this man-made island, Deshima, was purpose-built to house foreigners, basically, for the Dutch to stay there and stay only there until they were allowed once a year to go. The head of the, um, the Dutch uh, East India Company on Dejima was allowed to go once a year to the Shogun to bring in gifts. And um, the although some kind of reciprocity, you know, one would think would be implied, actually, after a while, the Shogun stopped giving back gifts in return for the gifts that the Dutch brought and just told them to bring him things instead. Um, so this is this is Dejima, this is where the, the Dutch are operating out of. Um, and this here is a um, an anatomical um, an anatomical plate from the medical textbook uh, Anatomisch Tabellen by uh, the Dutch. Uh, sorry, by Johann Adam Kulmus, who's actually uh, Polish, I think, but it's a Dutch version, a Dutch copy that was brought to Japan. Now, why is this important? Well, I mean, first of all, uh, if you guys uh, if you guys have already done or, or already seen some classical art, these are highly classical poses. This is a tradition in European art and European science to portray anatomy, to portray bodies um, in the form of classical sculpture. So we've got a kind of um, Aphrodite of Nidos pose going on on woman on the left, and the man on the on the right. We've got a kind of contraposto uh, from behind Dori Foros um, going on. Now this is important because um, one major thing that happened in the 1770s was the first um, the first autopsy um, done by a Japanese. Uh, citizen, proper citizen, probably not the right word, a, a Japanese kind of um, upper class person. The professional doctors did not perform autopsies in Edo, uh, Japan. It, in the city of Edo itself, bodies were taken outside the walls to be buried and for their post-mortems to be undertaken. But in, 17, seven, in 1771, the body of a criminal was allowed to be dissected and a, a man named Sugata Genpaku was a aristocrat um, from Edo. And he was allowed by the shogun, having read Dutch anatomical textbooks and wanting to see if they were right, he was allowed to go to the autopsy. And when he read the, the book against looking at the autopsy, he said, you know, this is basically perfect to what we actually find in the body. The reason um, autopsies hadn't been carried out was because it was considered unclean with work like tanning leather, um, and things like that, and, and meat uh, butchery and things like that were all considered unclean, uh, and so they were done outside of the city walls. But Sugata Genpaku, having previously been trained in Chinese medicine, which did not place as much of an emphasis on anatomy as European medicine did, um, said, that, said, and I quote, previously we were, we were totally without knowledge of the true nature of our bodies. And this is interesting because already the classical is is informing Japanese uh, visions of the body and visions of 
um, a visual culture and, and, and how to interact with the world, even if um, it's not directly appearing to the people doing the autopsy that these are based on classical images. But this probably is the most, uh, well, this is where we get into the actual most deliberately classical images. This is Utagawa Toyoharu's um, Dutch view of a Franciscan monastery. And this version is actually on display at the Victoria and Albert Museum. Um, and so when we've got all of these images circulating, and we've got books like the anatomy textbook from the previous slide, the Dutch bring paintings. And it's clear from this, as we'll see later, that they had brought some capricci, capriccios of, of Rome. So capricci, or a singular of capriccio, is a smashed together picture of a landscape with ruins on it and landmarks on it that do not normally go together. Um, as we'll see a little bit uh, later, these buildings, um, and I'll, I'll pull apart what they are in a second, you'll recognize some of them, no doubt. Um, they don't go together in their natural landscape. Um, and this has clearly been borrowed from Giovanni Paolo Panini. I'll actually just skip through here to show you. There you go, there's, there's the, the, the Roman Capriccios, uh, Capricci of, of Panini. So you see that is where the inspiration is coming from. But what I'm interested in here is what the Japanese artists, the Ukawa artists are doing with these. Um, these woodblock prints take about, they, they take in the hundreds to the thousands um, of sales. They're very cheap, but they take in the hundreds, of th hundreds to thousands of sales to be profitable. And so what happens is the artist draws uh, etches into the wood what is going to be printed, but then on several different blocks paints the colors. So Toyoharu will have chosen the colors that eventually ended up on this version, the latest version. But until it was profitable, it couldn't be printed in full color. Um, and so we see the colors get added over time. It's, it's painted in, in, in dull colors. There's a lot of white on this one. This one leaves some of the details white and then and the sky. And then this one has basically full color. Um, this is because and this is how we know, actually, because we have three different versions, this print was, was very, very popular. Um, but you probably noticed, if I haven't been skipping through the slides too quickly, that this, um, that this, this print isn't called, you know, view of Roman ruins or whatever, or a capriccio inspired by Panini or, 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 or you know, a view of the Forum in Rome or anything. It's called Dutch View of a Franciscan Monastery, which, you know, makes basically no sense. Um, it, but it does make sense for a, a Japanese viewer, because, as I said, Europe isn't really the category that Japanese people are thinking with. Ronald Toby has written a very good article about the kind of early anthropology that's going on in how... Um, Japanese people were interacting with, with foreigners, with Nanban in Nanbanjin in, in this time. So Dutch view is doing the kind of the work of saying that this is foreign and that we should, you know, when you read it's so it's down here, you, you read the word for um, Dutch, which is Oranda um, from Holland. Um, you know that this is something that's going to be a bit weird. It's going to be a bit, it's going to be a bit foreign. Um, but Dutch view of a Franciscan monastery adds a kind of double disconnect because Franciscans are Catholics and the Dutch famously majority Protestant, especially in this period. And the Catholics were the Portuguese missionaries who'd been, um, who'd, who'd been expelled in the 1630s. So this plays with foreignness in a way that is meant to be quite, quite strange. After all, on the Panini paintings, it doesn't say anywhere really that this is, you know, that each, each individual piece of these paintings is a particular thing. These, to a Japanese viewer, are no doubt meant to be important, probably ruined buildings, but beyond that, their cultural significance is really unknown. So when we break this up, we'll start from, from here, so you can see it in, in, in its kind of full colour. 
right here we've got uh, the equestrian statue of Marcus Aurelius, the Roman Empire, the Roman Emperor of the second century. And Marcus Aurelius's statue is actually on the Capitoline Hill, um, which is, uh, I mean, this landscape is entirely made up, but um, in Rome, uh, behind the Forum is Capitoline Hill, and you've got Marcus Aurelius on, on the horse there. Um, you can go and see it in the Capitoline Museum. And you've also got Trajan's column here, right? So there they are. Now, Trajan's column is in the Forum of Trajan, in, in Rome, which is not too far away, but certainly far removed from where Marcus Aurelius is on the Capitoline Hill. Likewise, we've got some arches, you see here and, and here. Now the three bay arch, not quite sure what it could be, but the single uh, or double bay arch is the arch of Titus right outside the forum. I'll show you a, a longer view picture of the forum so you can get a sense of, of, of where we are uh, in a second. And then the three bay arch could either be the arch of Septimius Severus in the forum here, or the arch of Constantine right by the Colosseum here. But what's important is that though as classicists we might want to say, oh I know that and point to that, the whole game of these prints for Japanese viewers is actually the fun of not knowing, of this being deliberately strange. I mean the, the sky and this, the kind of wispy clouds shooting up from some of the buildings and from behind the hills, rather than kind of as they were before coming across the sky, is deliberately striking. Um, you know, we can't help but feel that we're in some kind of dreamscape anyway, regardless of whether we know that this is based on a style of painting that, um, that draws upon making, making up uh, composite landscapes out of things we already know. And we, of course, have these bigger buildings. There's two most recognizable ones on the right and the left is no doubt you'll recognize the Colosseum. And we've got the Temple of Saturn from the Forum in Rome. So here is the Temple of Saturn. This is a, a good long view of the Forum. So the Colosseum is just over here. And the Arch of Titus is a bit closer over here. And the Arch of Constantine is right by the Colosseum. And then that's the, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, that's the Arch of Septimius Severus. And it's somewhere over here off screen that is the column of Trajan. Um, so what Panini has already done before the Dutch brought the painting over to Nagasaki and then to eventually to Edo, where it was copied by Otagawa Toyoharu, um, what Panini has done is built classical landscapes to kind of epitomize ruins and, 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 and um, these classical things. But this has been brought over, and, and for Panini and his audience, this has a great deal of import, right? We're looking at things that we should care about, right? We should see a kind of, um, a kind of legacy, a, um, a kind of maybe even some kind of emotional impact, some kind of sadness that these things are no longer in, in kind of the height of their power. They just represent a, a bygone civilization that we ought to remember. Um, but realistically, Toyoharu doesn't give us that at all. I mean, the title itself doesn't even refer to Rome. We don't even know the importance of Rome apart from for Franciscans, maybe, if we're Japanese viewers. Um, there are, certainly are mass published history books about Rome and Greece until um, probably after the Meiji Revolution, Meiji Restoration in 1868. And one interesting thing about the colours in the in all versions of this painting, but I'll, I'll I'll stick with the last one, is that Marcus Aurelius here. I don't know if 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 it, this strikes uh, anyone in the room, but Marcus Aurelius is the basically in the same colours as everybody else in the picture. Now it's quite normal for people in these pictures to be moving, to, for there to be people walking around, animals, things like this, but Marcus Aurelius almost looks as if he's on a horse on a pedestal anyway, just that, you know, he's not, he's not particularly um, differentiated. Okay, the horse looks um, a deep brown, perhaps bronze, but actually the clothing of everybody, either they're all statues or Marcus Aurelius is a real person or we're somewhere in between. Um, the whole point of this, I think, is that the classical itself 
actually doesn't have a meaning, nor would we really expect it to for Utagawa Toyoharu. Um, but this is why it's a shock to us as classicists and, and often to Western viewers, because we think, I know this painting, but realistically what this painting is trying to do, what the woodblock print is trying to do, is trying to su subvert any attempt at knowledge we might say we have about what this imagined landscape is. It's not about knowing what it is or about knowing how important it is, but it's about playing with, you know, what, what the images are that the Dutch have given the Japanese. Now, very quickly, um, because I would like to, if you guys have questions, I'd like to leave you time for questions. Um, very quickly, I will show you some of the other prints that uh, were made by Utagawa Toyoharu and his pupils. If you'd like to ask questions about those, please feel free. Um, so, once we get past Capricci, this here, um, and if anyone's interested in Pompeian art, for example, the wall paintings of Pompeii and Herculaneum, a, a painting in the ancient world itself, this is directly taken from those, uh, the kind of paintings that were circulating, the drawings, the copies that were made and circulated around Europe um, in the 18th century. And this, again, has a very funny title, very interesting title. Um, no reference to the ancient world it's called a perspective picture of a collection of rare medicines in Alemannia, which is Germany. Um, again, absolutely no reference to um, what we would think, you know, in saying I know that. Um, but what this is really playing with is Dutch perspective really, really intensely, because they would call it Dutch perspective. But when we talk about Western perspective here, Pompeian wall painting is a great example of this. Now, unfortunately, I don't have a good example on my PowerPoint for you, but I'm sure you could look into it or, or Fran would be happy to show you. Um, that in Pompeian wall painting and Herculaneum, there is this effect called trompe l'oeil, which is a kind of radical 3D-ness of a 2D image. It makes it look as if it extends back very far. And that's what's going on here. And we get the direct juxtaposition of this seemingly very deep room and then um, the kind of flat seaboard behind it, which does still have a vanishing point, but still looks kind of much further away um, and as if the kind of spatial bounds are, aren't equal. And that's before we even get into the deliberately classicizing bodies of, of these, these statues here. Again, are they really statues because he's dressed basically exactly the same as these people or are they all statues? Uh, we don't know. But this is, again, a very interesting painting. And then Toyoharu has pupils. Um, oh, this is Toyoharu's Ryogoku Bridge, um, which is playing with its, its frame. This is a Japanese image. Um, but this centers on the fact that these woodblock prints all derive around a kind of ephemeral moment, right? We see these, these fireworks going off, but they'll be gone in an instant, they'll fizzled out. And so the kind of play is a, is a you know, the enjoyment and things like that are, are a kind of central part of what woodblock prints already do. Uh, this is Toyoharu's um, Korea, actually. This is this is called Korea or Choshan. Um, and again, these are th this again is deliberately playing with categories of foreignness. What we're seeing is, is, is people in European outfits on a canal, much like, you know, in the Netherlands, um, and it's called Korea. Um, so, so again, we're, we're seeing deliberate play with, with these things. Now, this is where we get into his, his pupils, and I'll just run through these very quickly, because these are some of the most interesting, but unfortunately, I'd, I'd rather I'd rather have given you the depth on, um, on, on, the, on, the, first, on the first print. Um, this is from a series by Toyoharu's pr uh, pupil, uh, Utagawa Kuninaga, on... Um, it's called newly published Dutch perspective pictures. So again, we get Dutch as the foreign marker going on. But this series is the seven wonders of the ancient world. Um, this is the Colossus of Rhodes, but it's actually called um, the colossal statue of a bronze man on the island of Rhodes. Now notice that the Colossus of Rhodes is not a classical, he's not a classical sculpture at all here. He's got the head of a Buddha actually. Um, and there is uh, one example of a colossal bronze Buddha at the Todaiji Temple in Nara. This, is, this has a kind of lineage in Japan as a means of understanding what a giant bronze sculpture might look like. So when you hear that there's a big bronze man, 
on roads, you think, well, what's the nearest thing to a, a, a kind of giant bronze statue we have? It's probably it's probably that, it's probably the Buddha. Uh, this is Utagawa Kunitora's um, uh, Colossus of Rhodes, but this is called Dutch Ships Entering the Port Island of Rhodes. And this is much weirder than, um, than his, his fellow Utagawa school member. Um, and actually the hilarious part is that the title Dutch Ships Entering the Port Island of Rhodes doesn't mention the big bronze man in the middle of it at all. Uh, this is where they probably got it from, a Dutch map, Willem Blau's um, map of the world. It had border images of the seven wonders of the world. So you see the kind of similarities there. Uh, this is the walls of Babylon in Asia. This is the pyramids of Egypt. I think this is called the tall, uh, this is the tall pointed plinths of Egypt, which are actually... Um, the Nubian pyramids, I think in Meroe, not the pyramids of Giza that they're modeled off. But again, the distinction doesn't matter to uh, Utagawa Kundanaga. This, interestingly, is called the stone edifice and figure of Jupiter in Europe. It's meant to be the temple, the temple of Jupiter at Olympia uh, and the, the colossal statue of him, but actually just shows some kind of quasi foreign people enjoying um, enjoying some repose in a, in a kind of foreign residence. Uh, this again is, a, is an interesting image to compare with what we see with foreigners. They're deliberately made to look quite strange here, not Japanese, not Asian, not foreign, um, because this is a, a kind of typical image of a, of a Dutch man and woman from Nagasaki. This is called the Tomb of Mausolus in Asia, but I don't, if anyone's seen old images of of, of what drawings of, of, of uh, temples and, and the tomb of Mausolus look like. This is actually the temple of Artemis at Ephesus, it's actually modeled like that. Um, there you go. Here is the map image of the temple of Artemis at Ephesus. And there's the mausoleum of Halicarnassus. Now, because they're right next to each other, it's likely that actually they just read, um, they, they, they saw this and um, it was explained to them and realistically, they either didn't care what the proper name for it was or they didn't know. Um, and so called this the Mausoleum of Halicarnassus and didn't uh, do a print of, of, the, um, of, the, of, of the model of, of the temple of, oh, sorry, of the Mausoleum of Halicarnassus and, and then left out the name of the Temple of Artemis. Um, so I think that's it. I'll leave you time for questions. Thank you very much. That was uh, really wonderful. I really enjoyed that very much. We, we have got only a couple of minutes, so probably have time for a couple of questions, but I have noticed you've put your email address on the handout. If anyone yeah. has anything they want to know more, would you be willing for them to contact you? Yeah, ab absolutely. And um, if anyone needs, because um, I've given you some suggested reading, if anyone wants PDFs of articles or anything like that, uh, that I can get open access, then I'll, I'll direct you to that um, as well. Thank you, that's really helpful. Just, so, just in case anyone feels like they're missing out on getting a chance to ask a question, they can email Harvey directly. Is there anything that you want to know immediately? Have any questions? Yes, Richard. Uh, Richard's asking about Japanese isolation from mm. the Europeans. Why was there no understanding? Well, the main reason is that um, the Japanese had effectively, after the, in about 1615, had closed themselves off from, I mean, European trade had not kicked off in, in Japan, certainly, uh, by that point, anyway. Um, there weren't very many Dutch traders. The Dutch East India Company wasn't in uh, that region until uh until the mid 1600s so the reason there wasn't any understanding is because the japanese were very selective over who they let in and who they didn't and the portuguese kind of forced their way in and so did the dutch um but realistically korea and china were more open to to europeans than than, um, than the japanese were very much Uh, 
would they have any recognition or understanding of the wood footprint in terms of what they were depicting? Mm, now, it depends what you mean by what they were depicting, because if you mean the classical sculptures and architecture, no, they wouldn't have had any clue, basically. The average person wouldn't have had any clue. The, the, the whole medium of woodblock print is designed around mass production, mass sales, mass profitability, and the mass consumerism, effectively. These were put out, there were some great woodblock prints, I, I I probably should have included it in the in the PowerPoint. There's a great woodblock print by Hokusai, actually, the guy who did the Great Wave, um, of uh, of a shop of woodblock prints, and they get put out like magazines do now on stacks for people to look round at them and pick them. The whole point is they're meant to be like funny, either funny or interesting or weird to look at, right? The stranger, the more out there the design, or the more intricate the design, the more interested in it you are. So um, it's not really about recognition at all. And that's part of the fun. The, it's kind of pointing at things that from that the Dutch have brought and saying, what is that? You know. Fabulous. But was that the, the question you were thinking about? Yeah, because it can feel really strange that because as especially a classicist in the room, I was looking at those pictures as you were putting them up and I was going, Oh, there is, I think I saw a discus thrower at one point and, yeah. and the, the dying gall, and you can't help but try and spot them. But yeah. it's really interesting to know that that wasn't the case. Uh, in Japan yeah. that instead mass production is just about the exotic. Absolutely fascinating. Um, can we just give Harvey a round of applause for the fact that he's really looking. Thank you. Thank you very so, much. What I'll do is I'll just uh, I'll stop the recording and then I'll, I'll keep you on for a few minutes to say thank you and I'll just dismiss yeah. everybody as well. Yeah. But thank you so much.